but I'd like to welcome you all today uh, to, uh, to the RAL seminar series. And just a couple of housekeeping details uh, that I'd like to, to go through. Um, first, for, for those of you who are in the Zoom room, uh, we will be taking questions after the seminar um, and Amanda will be moderating the Q&A and uh, we ask you all to uh, use the raise hands feature. So for those of you in the Zoom room, um, down at the bottom of the screen, you should see a reactions button. And then from there, you see the raise hand button. And then Amanda will call on you um, when, it's, when it's time to ask questions. Also, for those of you on the webcast, we welcome you as well. And starting today, we've uh, added a, a Slido option so that those of you on the webcast can also ask questions. Um, and that's in response to some feedback that we had from Ralph staff that uh, we'd just like to be able to um, allow everyone viewing to ask questions. And so we'll be uh, retaining the Slido uh, for webcast viewers moving forward for future seminars as well. I believe that's all the housekeeping details that I have to go through right now. So now I'm going to toss it over to Amanda to introduce our speaker for today. Great, thank you, Jared. It's very much my pleasure to introduce Brittany Welch, who is currently visiting us as part of the ASP Graduate Visitor Program uh, until the end of June this year. Brittany is currently an atmospheric science PhD candidate at the University of Utah. She acquired her Bachelor of Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2018, and just recently graduated with her MS in atmospheric science at Utah this spring. Brittany's been researching in the road weather field since she participated in the SOARS program here at RAL in 2017. During her two years in SOARS, she developed and improved a truck blowover algorithm using vehicle crash data from Wyoming. Um, this will be what her presentation's about today. This algorithm's actively running in the Pike Alert system used by the Wyoming De Transportation Management Center, part of the Department of Transportation up here in Wyoming. Brittany's master's work focused on the verification of statistical analysis of an L3 Harris product used to produce image-derived road weather conditions. And currently her PhD work focuses on discerning the potential uses of the HER model in UAV decision support and operations in large cities. She's also actively involved in outreach, has presented at several weather conferences, served as a panelist at a transportation conference and is part of the STEM outreach program and is an active student member of the AMS Surface Transportation Committee. Uh, so welcome to Brittany and go ahead and uh, start presenting. Thank you, Amanda, for that wonderful introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm Brittany. Um, and as Amanda said, I'll be talking about some work that I did during this during my time in SOARS, uh, where I developed a truck blowover algorithm uh, for Pike Alert. So um, let's get going here then. So I have an outline here to kind of guide us through what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what we're going to talk about is my motivation for this project, uh, which was or the motivation for what we're going to talk about here today, which is the impact of weather on roads. And then we'll go into a bit of background into Wyoming and its uh, type of weather issues. And then something called the Connected Vehicle Pilot or CVP program that the Wyoming Department of Transportation is a part of. And then how Pike Alert fits into that. Uh, next. We'll talk about uh, analysis and case studies for the algorithm, the blower algorithm that I uh, created with Amanda for Pike Alert. And in that, we'll be talking about duration analysis. So how often uh, does the blower algorithm alert, so to speak, uh, in a year? And then we'll be talking about some high wind case studies and then probability of detection and sensitivity analysis. And then lastly, in the summary, we'll kind of go through the changes of the algorithm over the uh, two years that I was developing it and uh, what the outcome would be. So I like to start these presentations by helping you, by putting you in the shoes of uh, the people who are affected by this type of stuff. So this graphic here is a graphic of all of the, the network of roads across the entire United States with the darker red lines here being uh, major interstates, such as Interstate 80 that goes along here, or I-70 um, that goes along further south. 
So what I want you all to do is that I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a truck driver. A lot of us have driven on roads in our personal cars, but imagine driving this massive vehicle where you have to, you know, account for the sway and yaw and, and all types of weather conditions that can impact how safely you can drive said large vehicle. And so there's wet roads, snowy roads, and icy roads that can all impact your risk while you're driving this massive truck. And so because of that risk, um, because wet roads, snowy roads, and icy roads have some sort of risk associated with it that can inhibit your ability to drive uh, in a crash statistics between 20, 2005 and 2014, it was seen that 5,000 fatalities occurred due to road weather. So all these types of or forms of weather that impact the road. And then you had over 1 million crashes uh, as a result of road weather. And so uh, the figure on the left here, this table, uh, is, a, is a graphic of the 10-year average weather fatalities for various types of weather, so whether it's hurricane, lightning, flood, heat, or tornadoes. However, when you put the road weather fatalities on the, the right here, when you put those in that same graphic, you can see that road weather fatalities are an order of magnitude higher uh, than all these other types of weather phenomena. Not to discredit the other weather phenomena, but it means that we have some work to do in the realm of road weather. And so now we narrow our focus a little bit from across the entire country to now being in the state of Wyoming in particular. So we talked about how there's icy roads, snowy roads, and wet roads. But another uh, weather phenomenon that can impact how safely truck drivers can traverse the interstate are high winds. And this video will show you an example of how dangerous high winds can be to vehicles. So I want you all to pay attention to the, uh, where these two arrows are pointing. So one arrow is pointing at the antenna on this police cruiser. And so I want you to pay attention to how much it sways back and forth and at what angle and then I also want you to pay attention to this truck over here uh, that will be coming along the roadway. So let's do this. And so what you'll notice here is you'll notice that as time goes on, you'll see that antenna start to bend more and more uh, towards the left. And to preface, there is no one in the police cruiser behind this car and the truck just tips over right onto the police cruiser. And you noticed how the, um, the antenna here bent really far forward. That was probably due to a wind gust that pushed over this truck as well. And so what we know about Wyoming's, uh, Wyoming's winds and severe weather and freight is that we know that Interstate 80 is heavily trafficked by freight vehicles. Um, over half of the vehicles that are on I-80 uh, are freight vehicles. We also know that Wyoming has a, a variety of severe weather conditions, whether it, it's snow or ice on the road or even wind, like we just talked about. And then that can lead to commercial vehicle accidents and even um, personal vehicle accidents as well, whether the trucks blow over or slide off the road or what have you. And these uh, little pictures that are now under these boxes here kind of illustrate what I just said, um, where you have Interstate 80 is a major east coast corridor, heavily trafficked by freight. Um, you have various types of severe weather. And then in a one year period alone, the Wyoming Department of Transportation assessed that they had over 700 uh, commercial vehicle accidents and then 1,500 hours of road closures. And, in Wy and what that means is that in Wyoming, along Interstate 80 and uh, Interstate 25, they will actually close the road to certain vehicles or all vehicles because the weather conditions are so severe um, that people will more than likely have accidents, whether they blow over or pile up or what have you. And Wyoming wants to avoid those situations and avoid uh, the potential loss of life. And so what I wanted to take a look at, look at here was the duration of high wind events uh, or high wind uh, events in Arwis in Wyoming. 
And so what this graphic essentially shows you is on the x-axis here at the bottom is the Wyoming stations. And on the y-axis here, it's a percentage of time of the year that a particular station is above or has wind gusts above 20 meters per second. And you'll notice here that on the far right um, that you have the station uh, KARL or Arlington City, which Arlington City is actually um, at one of the highest elevation points uh, along I-80 and uh, also right next to high terrain or some mountains. And so you can see that a majority of the year, uh, that station has very high winds. And then going down the list here, you can see that most of these stations in this area of uh, 10 to 40% are stations that are along major interstates. So I-80 or I-25. Or, uh, I so we've kind of discussed how wind can impact vehicles along the road. And so what is the Wyoming Department of Transportation kind of doing to help with this? So uh, the Wyoming Department of Transportation became part of the Connected Vehicle Pilot or the CVP, where they essentially want to use vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication to help, to help get more data and information out there to help you be safer on the road as a driver. And so essentially um, what they use with that technology is they use something called roadside units. And roadside units are essentially uh, systems that are typically on dynamic message signs and they are able to co communicate with vehicles and also able to communicate and send uh, information to the transportation management center. And then onboard units are typically systems that are attached or installed inside a vehicle where that, that system is allowed to communicate with the roadside units. And then you have the directed short range communications where essentially you get that vehicle to vehicle communication uh, infrastructure. And so in the image on the right, we can see kind of all of this in motion. Uh, you have this vehicle slipping on ice, this red vehicle here. And what happens is that that vehicle can then communicate with a, a roadside unit, which can talk to another vehicle. And then all this information essentially can get put together and get combined with your typical weather information, such as radar, or uh, uh, forecasts and things like that and be processed by a system called Pike Alert to give you something uh, on a segment by segment, road segment by road segment basis as to what's going on or with the road or the weather condition. And so this figure illustrates that as well. So you have the vehicle system. So you have those onboard units where uh, as part of the Wyoming CV program, they have onboard units and snow plows, certain freight vehicles, uh, emergency vehicles. And then if you have a, a happenstance of a truck driving by that also has the two, they'll, they'll be able to communicate with the roadside units infrastructure that you'll see on the dynamic message sign. And that information um, can get passed back to the Transportation Management Center where it goes through Pycular and gives them sort of uh, a simplistic view of what all this data is saying. And then that information can then be passed back towards uh, these vehicles here on the left. So now we can dive a little bit more into the Pycular system. So the Pycular system has road weather hazard modules or RWH modules where you get road statistics, forecasts, and they combine together to give you some sort of specific road segment hazards. So each of these little dashes here on the image on the top with the vehicles is a road segment. And what Pike Alert will do is it'll assess all the data that is given to it, vehicle data and traditional weather data, and tell you what is going on with that road, whether it's uh, or what type of weather conditions are going on, whether it's a now cast or a forecast. And then uh, this, the second image below kind of describes how you would integrate weather information 
into these same rogue, se rogue segments. So you integrate vehicle and weather information. And the road weather hazard module uses three types of algorithms. It has a, it has a pavement condition algorithm, a precipitation and a visibility algorithm. But at the time uh, that I was doing this work, it did not have a wind or blowover algorithm quite yet. And so uh, the road weather hazard, the road weather alert module takes all this weather information and translates it into some sort of warning or advisory. And so you can see that in the image below here where you have all these little road segments here that are telling you green means good, the road condition is good. However, where you have uh, this band of precipitation here and all these snow plows illustrated by the orange uh, specks here and the roadways here are also orange, meaning that the road conditions uh, aren't quite favorable in those areas. So this, that's kind of an example of how uh, Pike Alert translates all this information into something uh, that makes sense to the user. And then what you can also do um, with the Pike Alert system is that you can go to specific roadway segments and you can see what the alert summary has been for a specific uh, through a specific algorithm, where, whether it's precipitation or visibility. And this uh, little part here on the right is an illustration of that. And what we wanted to do is, we just talked about how wind is a key factor in whether you can drive safely on the road or not. And we wanted to improve Pike Alert and improve safety and awareness by adding um, a blowover algorithm, especially uh, in Wyoming where high winds are quite frequent. And so this figure here illustrates the general idea of our algorithm that we wanted to put in Pike Alert. So you have an Arwis station here, and from this Arwis station, uh, the uh, or Pike Alert can ingest uh, wind speed, wind gust, road condition, road orientation, and wind direction. And then within the algorithm itself, uh, it goes through a bunch of weights and functions where it will essentially output a passenger risk, a heavy truck risk, and a light risk. And depending on the threshold that we have uh, for each of those vehicles or just overall, a driver alert will be sent out uh, to drivers in a certain road set segment or a certain region uh, on the interstate as illustrated by these vehicles down here at the bottom. And so our blowover algorithm uses fuzzy logic methodology. And so you, with fuzzy logic methodology, um, you have a set of weights and interest values for each of the variables that we just talked about. And the initial values were based on um, previous work by Young and Lies in 2017 and Baker et al. Uh, 2008. And essentially the algorithm will ingest, will ingest uh, sustained wind speed and wind gust. And it'll also do a wind, ingest wind gust differential, or compute wind gust dif differential, and it'll ingest wind direction and road direction. And then you'll have three sets of equations for each vehicle class. So you'll have an equation for each of these uh, variables here. And and the figure below is a kind of general illustration of what the algorithm would be doing. You'd have a, a wind speed weight, if we focus on wind speed here, you'd have a wind speed weight. So how important is wind speed in uh, blowover? And then based on that, you'll have a, a function here that will kind of go through uh, and based on your wind speed, it'll, it'll be at a certain level. And so what you have here is that it'll, it'll then produce an interest value between negative one and one for each vehicle classification. And then it'll determine the type of advisory or warning that each vehicle will receive. And so essentially, uh, if we want to, if all of this adds up to an interest value of let's say 0.6, uh, that is our threshold to say that this vehicle should not be on this road 
and it is by said it should get off the road. And so uh, now we'll jump into some of the results. Uh, over the course of the two years in SOARS, uh, there were seven different versions of the algorithm that were developed. Currently version six is running in PyCalert right now. And I'm gonna kind of show you the progression or the differences between each version of the algorithm where we will do a duration, of, a duration analysis. Oh, sorry. We'll do a duration analysis that will tell us the fraction of time out of a year, so 2016, that the that blowover alerts were given. And then we'll do some case studies where we'll analyze all seven versions of the algorithm for these case studies and give a probability of detection. And then lastly, we'll do a probability of detection analysis and sensitivity analysis. Um, which will be similar to this image here in the top right. So first, uh, we will jump into the case studies. So essentially with our case studies, we had, we had three different case study sets with a small case study, a medium case study, and then a large case study. And these case studies were based on a crash data set um, that was acquired through personal connection. And this crash data set included information about whether what type of crash happened, whether it was a blowover or not. And then it had information on wind speed, wind gusts, traditional weather variables, as well as the location of each crash and the road orientation and such. Um, so based off this crash data set, we found a few cases in there where we knew that a blowover occurred, and we also knew that on that particular day, it was a high wind event. And then for the medium case study, we used the 10-year uh, crash data set that I just talked about. And we set a condition such that the condition was severe wind only because in the crash data set, there's a weather condition uh, or there's a weather condition column that, that will tell you what the weather conditions were. And then the crash had to be an overturned type of crash, so meaning a blowover. And then um, out, of, out of all these conditions here, um, only 32 of our 82 cases met that condition. And then for the large case study, um, we had the same condition here where you have the severe wind only in the overturned type of crash uh, for that 10 year crash data set. So first we'll get into uh, our smaller case study where we look at a time series for a particular station, uh, which uh, some of you may be familiar with this event that happened this year, uh, January 13th uh, of this year, where there was a severe wind event across Wyoming, but also across some of the Great Plains as well. And I chose a, a station here, uh, y Y29 as it's called, that is actually east of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm sorry, west of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And what I did is I decided to, for each version of the algorithm, I wanted to see how the interest value changed over the course of this high wind event. And so what you'll see here in this top left image is you'll see interest value on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And then you'll see the colors in this time series changing a little bit. Those colors represent wind gusts in meters per second. So the lighter orange colors represent something roughly in the 10 meter per second range. And then as you get up here to these darker red colors, um, that's more in the 30 to 40 meter per second range. So version one of the algorithm is the very first version of the algorithm that we started with. And then changes were made over the course of several versions to uh, to help with, help prevent under alerting, but also help prevent over alerting. Um, and so what you'll notice here with the first version of the algorithm is that as, as time goes on here, you can see that the wind event gets progressively worse. And you'll see that as the wind gust speed increases, so does the interest value of our algorithm until you get to this point right here um, where we cross our threshold of 0 
meaning that we would alert particularly for for light trucks, so trucks that do not have any uh, materials in it whatsoever. We are particularly alert for light trucks uh, that they should not uh, they should be not they should not be on the road at this time. And so what we notice here is the difference between version one and version two and three is that you can see that uh, it takes lower wind speed or wind gust speeds to have a higher interest value at this point. So we did this mainly because we noticed that it didn't take a very it didn't take much to blow over a light truck in particular. And so for the light truck vehicle category, um, we decided to uh, bump up the thresholds for, or lower the thresholds for wind gust speed because light trucks are especially vulnerable to high winds. And then the difference between version uh, three and, or two and three and four and five are very slight differences. Uh, mainly, you'll notice that some variables are a bit more constrained now uh, within this area between two and three and four and five. And then lastly, between four and five and six and seven, you'll see that uh, for the upper range of our gust speed, uh, you'll see uh, this area here that I'm circling, and then this area on the right, you'll see that it's less um, variable and more consistent at the top here, uh, mainly because we decided to kind of have a more, uh, a more consistent upper threshold, upper range of our threshold for wind gust speed uh, for anything over about 35 meters per second. That's pretty extreme. And so then I wanted to show you um, another station for the same event uh, called Y21. So with Y21, it is at a site called Arlington, Wyoming where Arlington, Wyoming is at one of the, the highest points uh, on I-80. Uh, and it's also right next to high terrain, such as mountains as, as well too. So you'll have winds that could curve around the mountain or come over the mountain. And so this particular site, we saw um, maximum uh, wind gust speeds of up to 42 or 44 meters per second. And so I thought it would be interesting to do this extreme high wind case and see how each version of the algorithm performed. And so what we wanna look for is we wanna look at the 0 0.6 interest threshold to see when each of the algorithms would trigger for our light trucks. So you can see that with version one of the algorithm, even though the winds here are, are approaching 35 meters per second, at this stage, uh, the version one of the algorithm still wouldn't have alerted. And at this point, um, more than likely, a, a large number of light trucks would have blown over at this stage. And so that's why between version uh, one and two and three, we increase the upper bound of our threshold such that anything really above 35 meters per second um, would essentially uh, trigger trigger for light or light trucks, I should say. And so you'll notice here the difference between one and two um, is that for most of the time during this event, uh, uh, it was above 0 0.6 interest value. And then as the event tapered off and the winds got down back below 25 or 20 meters per second, uh, our interest values decreased towards zero. And then the main difference between two and three and uh, four is that you'll kind of notice here, you'll kind of notice here that uh, there's a, a little bit more variability when you get towards these uh, lower values here. So this particular spike downward here or um, kind of lull in the event you'll see has a slightly lower interest value than previously. And then going from four to five and seven, uh, we'll see that this value is roughly the same that we just talked about, if not a little bit lower. So just little tweaks here and there between uh, four and then five 
numbers five and seven of the algorithm. And so next we'll talk about our duration analysis. So with the duration analysis, we essentially wanted to see how often in a, over the course of a year, 2016, would uh, each of the vehicle classes be alerting? Because we don't want to over alert, but we also don't want to under alert. And the goal was to minimize the spatial and temporal duration of alerts while maximizing the probability of detection. Um, so here with regular vehicle classes, you'll see that uh, for each version of the algorithm, except six and seven, the, the percentage of the year that you would alert is very, very low. Uh, as it should be a normal passenger vehicle, it takes a lot to blow over a normal passenger vehicle. Um, so you would expect this to be very low because the winds needed to do that would be extremely high. Uh, we also added a vehicle class called pickup with trailer for pickup. Uh, what I did notice during my analysis is that if you have a passenger vehicle that has a trailer attached, let's say a camper or something that you're transporting your uh, objects in or something, they tend to actually act more so like light trucks than anything because you now you have this pivot point between the vehicle and then whatever you're pulling, and that can add some, some yaw and sway in your vehicle that can cause you to crash. And so uh, when, we added this when we added this category, we saw that uh, since they behaved a lot like light trucks, um, we had similar thresholds for them, um, but they would also have lower thresholds because the pivot point between the vehicle and, the, the, uh, and whatever you're pulling is a lot more loose than it would be for a freight truck. And so that's why you'll see that going from version one to version three and beyond, um, you have a higher percentage or higher fraction of time uh, where the wind, where you would actually alert um, for these vehicles. And then you have our light high profile trucks. So the light trucks that I was talking about uh, typically only about from version one to version seven, um, only about 40% of the year you would have these alerting. Um, and you'll see that from version uh, one to version four, we did have a decrease in our uh, percentage as we were kind of tweaking some of, or tweaking the importance of certain variables. Uh, we had decided that wind gust speed was a bit more important than uh, sustained wind speed. And so that's why you see this decrease here. Um, and then a further increase as we adjusted some thresholds. And then finally, for the loaded high profile vehicles, um, you'll see that these are also very low, kind of similar to the regular vehicles that we talked about where uh, they really don't get above 10% uh, of the year. And especially for the uh, active version running in PyCalert right now, version six is actually the lowest uh, percent of the year, mainly because the more weight you have on your vehicle, the harder it is to blow over. So even if this vehicle is high profile, because these vehicles are loaded down, it takes a lot higher wind and wind gusts to make it unstable. And so now I'll go into some algorithm adjustments. Um, so based on those case studies that I talked about earlier, uh, I was able to calculate the probability of detection. And the probability of detection is basically a hit. So whether a vehicle blew over uh, divided by uh, that event plus a miss, where a miss is where a vehicle blew over, but the algorithm said that there was no risk for blowover. And so essentially what our before and afters were, were uh, before was version five and after was version six. So what we changed between the fifth version and then our final version of uh, the algorithm that went into PyCalert. So the problem that we noticed in version five is that we were under alerting. Um, so we weren't alerting enough for certain vehicle classes. And the main reason was because 
we had a high alert interest. And so the cause of that alert, high alert interest was one of our functions for the heavy truck wind gust differential. So what we had to do is we essentially had to lower the alert thresh, the alert interest value. So meaning we lowered the alert interest from 0 0.7 to 0 0.6, but it is now. And then we had to lower the upper bound of the uh, threshold for the wind gust differential. For our medium cases, uh, where we had 32 cases in here, uh, we also noticed that we noticed similar things as the previous, the smaller case study, where we had some, we also had under alerting uh, between version five and six. As you can see, uh, the probability of detection for version five is very low, below 0.2. Um, and this again was caused by some functions in the heavy truck wind differential. Um, and so essentially what we had to do was adjust the weight of the wind direction. And so the weight of the wind direction at this point for version five was also too high, um, meaning that we put too much emphasis on it. And because at least in Wyoming, the winds are so variable um, because of the high terrain, it turns out that the wind direction for blowovers wasn't really um, all that important. And so what we changed in version six is that we decided to lower the upper bound of the wind of the wind differential even further. And then we adjusted the weight so that we, the weight of wind direction was slightly decreased. So it was less important. And then we put that extra weight more so into the wind gust. And so then for our large case, uh, we noticed under alerting again from version five to six. And so in our functions, that was mainly caused by the passenger and light trucks. Uh, and for those, it would be the wind speed and wind differential. And so what we had to do in order to improve our POD was to lower the upper bound of the wind speed for passengers, because initially our uh, threshold for wind speed for passengers was extremely high. Uh, and then we had to raise the upper bound for light trucks. So meaning that we essentially had to take the wind speed uh, threshold for light trucks and increase it so that it would cover a wider range. And then we also had issues uh, with our weight for wind direction again. So we further decreased the weight of wind direction and, and distributed that weight more so into, um, into the wind gust speed and the sustained wind speed. And so lastly here, um, we have our overall, I'm sorry if you hear thunder in the background. <laughs> So, so lastly, we have our overall like algorithm outputs for an entire year of 2016. And so what each of these graphs represent is each of the versions of the algorithm. And if you see a version missing, it's mainly because uh, the previous version or the next version is very similar. Um, and so what we have here is the change in algorithm interest. So interest on the y-axis here with wind gust for light trucks and the sustained wind speed of 20 meters per second. So what all that means is that we ran our algorithm just for light trucks where the sustained wind speed was less than 20 meters per second. And we wanted to see what the algorithm would output when we uh, plotted interest value versus wind gust. And so for a sustained wind speed of less than 20 meters per second, you have wind gusts that varies from zero to uh, 40 meters per second. And you can see the changes from version one to version two of the algorithm for light trucks where um, we kind of decrease this distribution among the interest values. Um, and you'll also see kind of more of a, a sharp cutoff a little bit sooner here. So this, this cutoff where it narrows uh, pretty, pretty hard here is roughly at a little bit above 35 meters per second. Whereas in version two, you can notice that now it's more um, closer to 25 meters per second. Um, and what we had learned from version one to version two was that light trucks were more vulnerable than we thought. 
Uh, so from version two to version uh, four, we you'll see uh, that these two are slightly different where you have a slightly different slope as you get above 15 meters per second. And then our little cutoff point is still very similar here. And the reason that you'll see this slight kink, uh, so a higher slope when you go from a 15 meters per second and then above is mainly because at that point, uh, when you reach 15 meters per second of wind gust, uh, you could imagine at this point that the truck is getting punched essentially by the wind a bit harder and that causes it to become more unstable uh, above 15 meters per second. Below 15 meters per second, that so-called punch isn't strong enough to make the truck uh, become unstable. And then between version four and five, uh, it was mainly just constraining values. So what you'll notice here is that with this line up here in version four, you'll notice that some of those points uh, now fit within the slope a bit more. Uh, so we decreased a few outliers, um, but for the most part, a majority of this line uh, is still here. And then lastly, from version five to version six and seven, uh, we became a little bit more lenient with our, with our uh, ranges and thresholds, thresholds below 15 meters per second. So you'll notice here that this area below 15 meters per second is rather constrained, whereas this area here uh, is a slightly wider distribution. And then you'll also notice that this uh, narrowing here at roughly 25 meters per second uh, is a little bit wider and the interest value is a little bit lower, um, mainly because we were, we were starting to get into the realm of overfitting our data set and we uh, didn't wanna do that. And so lastly, uh, this is a similar plot to what you just saw. It is the it is the algorithm run just for light trucks before a sustained wind speed of greater than 20 meters per second. So you get into that realm where you're in like a high wind advisory or the Wyoming Department of Transportation would probably advise light trucks not to travel on the road anymore. And so in version one of the algorithm, you can see that when you have a, a wind gust speed of 20 meters per second or higher, and a sustained wind speed of, of greater than 20 meters per second, the interest value is still rather low. And at this point, um, the winds are quite strong such that, especially if you get into the higher terrains on I-80, you would encounter uh, very strong winds. And so to, to, be having, to have an interest value of zero is quite low. And so from version uh, one to two, you can see drastic differences where a wind gust value and sustained wind speed value of greater, tw greater than 20 meters per second would kind of instantly start you at an interest value somewhere close to 0.5 and then going up from there as wind speed or as a uh, wind gust increases. Then from version two to four, um, you'll notice slight differences, but not, not too much. You'll see a little bit more leniency uh, down here where you have a few values that are a little bit lower, but then from version uh, four to six, you'll see that we once again constrained the values, but the difference between six and let's say two is that this, uh, this is a little bit more rectangular than version two, uh, mainly because we decided that at this point between four, version four and version six, we were probably as I said, overfitting the data too much and decided to give it a bit more leniency. And so one of the last things that I'll talk about here is a sensitivity analysis that one of the uh, Wyoming Department of Transportation uh, uh, staff did with our algorithm because they do currently use our algorithm uh, for their transportation management operations is uh, what he did is he did a sensitivity analysis of uh, the different variables of our algorithm. And so essentially what these colors mean on the left here is that 
Uh, for example, this darker blue line down here is just including the wind speed, right? And then he goes on to add the wind speed and the slick, the slickness to see what the interest value would be then, and then so on and so on. And whereas the uh, green line, he adds the slickness and then our road direction. And then lastly, this cyan line up here is our wind speed, uh, wind differential slickness and uh, road direction. So all of our variables. And you can see uh, that when you add in the wind gust differential here in the cyan line, uh, it drastically uh, raises our, our interest value or the, the slope of our interest value as we go up in wind speed here. And so I decided to do a similar analysis with our crash data set, our 10 year crash data set that we acquired um, to see if we had similar results. And so essentially uh, the same as the image on the left, this image on the right uh, has just the wind gust speed as this black line here at the bottom. And then you'll have wind gust speed plus slickness and wind gust speed plus uh, slickness and wind direction and so on. And you'll notice the same thing, which is very interesting, is that when you add our wind gust speed uh, to this equation, that our, um, our interest goes up really high. Um, and especially when you increased uh, with wind gust speed here on the x-axis, you'll notice that uh, the slope and the height of these lines are completely different. And so uh, now I'll kind of get into my summary and our findings from this whole process. So between version one and three of the algorithm, we noted that passenger vehicles with trailers have similar vulner vulnerability to light trucks. And so we added the pickup with trailer class. Uh, between version or in version four, we noticed that each vehicle has a different vulnerability to high winds. And so we added weights and variables for each vehicle's class set instead of uh, kind of combining them into one. And then we also made adjustments to the light pickup or the light pickup and loaded wind gust speeds because they were under alerting. Uh, for version six, five to six, we had uh, to, to a degree, we kind of had light trucks maintain their balance and sustained wind speeds that were less than 20 meters per second. But when you had wind gust speeds that were above 20 meters per second, you had increased yaw and instability. So we added more emphasis on wind gust for light trucks and pickups. Um, and then lastly, for version seven, uh, this version seven was more experimental where we had, where we realized that wet, snowy and icy roads have different traction. So they have less traction than the dry road. And so it might be easier to blow over a truck in that instance. So we primarily explored the finding wind speeds uh, based on a slickness value. So if the road was slick, maybe your wind speed threshold would be a little bit lower. And so the summary and limitations of all this, uh, overall, the importance of wind direction, uh, as I said, it wasn't all that important uh, in this study mainly because at least in Wyoming, the terrain limitations uh, caused a low significance in the wind direction. Then we also uh, had to lower the weight of our wind gust differential, mainly because uh, strong winds would still pose a threat to light trucks, especially even if the wind gust differential was low. And then <laughs> lastly, in the overall summary, um, we had to lower the wind gust speed for passenger vehicles. Typically, you would think it would take a tornado to, to move a vehicle, but when you're driving in high winds, you're, you have your steering wheel angled. And so if you have a wind gust that kind of adds to that, it can kind of increase uh, your risk of, of not being able to control your vehicle. And then some of the limitations of uh, the study or the terrain, uh, so matching wind speeds to a crash location. The RWIS stations didn't always match the uh, crash location, so we had these radius. Uh, and then the risk versus event issue, meaning that just because a blowover 
just because a blowover didn't happen doesn't mean there was no risk for it. So that's why Wyoming, uh, the Wyoming Department of Transportation closes the roads to light trucks with wind speeds still over 50 miles per hour because that risk exists and they don't want to take the chance. And then lastly was our vehicle classification. So some, some passenger vehicle types became unloaded types, meaning that um, essentially those pickups with trailers, uh, which were passenger vehicles, had to become uh, essentially unloaded white trucks because that's what they were similar to. And so uh, I just kind of want to go back and illustrate the importance of all this. You're a driver on the road. You want to be safe. You want to get to where you're going really fast and, and safely. And so you want all the information you can to do that. And then as, like, as a fleet manager or a snowplow driver, you want to increase the efficiency and safety of your drivers, but also the people you're trying to protect, like me and you. And so the Wyoming Department of Transportation, they'll do a, uh, they want to try and reduce the amount of road closures by having more access to what the weather is like along each segment of the roadway. So they want more data collection. And they also want to be more efficient in their emergency management procedures. And so that's how we kind of move up to the USDOT. They want to continue supporting projects like this one in connected vehicle technology, uh, such that they can improve the safety of drivers throughout the country. Um, so this project um, actually has a paper that will be coming out soon. And uh, thank you for your time, everyone. And I'll take any questions. Great, thank you, Brittany, for that really excellent presentation, very informative. Um, if anyone in the Zoom room has a question for Brittany, please either use the raised hand feature or you can um, type your question into the chat and I can take that. If you're on the live broadcast website, you can type your question into the Slido application and we will be able to get your question from there. Oh, Jared, looks like you have a question. You are still muted. So uh, great talk, Brittany. Um, so do you know, has, has YDOT um, uh, been, been using the, the different versions of this blow of, blowover algorithm? Um, have they been able to demonstrate um, a reduction in crashes or anything? I guess just how, how is this being used in YDOT currently is my question. So the only version that YDOT uses, so to speak, is version six. And the way that they use it is that this blower algorithm was integrated into PyColor, which PyColor has a variety of other algorithms too, for visibility, precipitation, et cetera. And so what YDOT will do is that in that Pike Alert interface along each segment of the roadway, which I believe is a mile long, uh, you'll get an assessment of whatever condition you're looking for, whether it's visibility or, or blowover risk or what have you. And so they'll use the information that's in there to kind of do what they need to do on the transportation management side. And while we're waiting for more questions, I'll just add um, a little bit because more integration has happened since Brittany finished up her uh, SOARS summer. So she she unfortunately wasn't involved really where she would have been. Um, but what YDOT has done is they have a system at their traffic management center called TRAC. And it's essentially a task list and the operators can go through and click off their different operations. They have what's called a 511 map. Um, those of you in Colorado have probably used Colorado's 511 system called codetrip.org. And essentially they maintain a map of weather conditions along the roadways. So in addition to uh, what Brittany was mentioning in terms of using it to guide their traffic management center decisions and operations, they're also using Pike Alert and the blowover algorithm to maintain that map in a more automated fashion. And then in terms of crash reduction, um, this project for reasons outside of uh, our personal 
control has uh, gone on a few more years than initially planned, but there is a performance management part to this project. So probably in the next year or two, we'll have information on whether crash rejection was um, obtained using the whole CB pilot setup. Thanks, Amanda, for that information. Yeah, um, we have a question from Bronco. Hi, Brittany. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question or maybe two. Uh, first is, uh, are there any data that you would like to have or that you could have that could further optimize the algorithm? Yeah, of course. More The more data, the better, actually. So what I would like to have is I would like to increase our crash data set. So have a, uh, the last update to the crash data set was in 2018, or at least that's uh, the version that I was using at the time. It would be interesting if there was anything between 2018 and now that I could use. Um, what I was also interested in integrating, which I talked about before, was kind of integrating grip or road traction into the algorithm to see if that has a factor uh, in, in truck blowover, so to speak. Um, so I believe more data, just more of our crash data set and then uh, integrating grip uh, would also be nice too. The only problem with trying to integrate grip is that not every RWIS station has a grip sensor. And so it would be rather difficult to do that in particular. Thank you. Your question. So, um, see, we have a couple of questions on the Slido. So, Brett, if you could uh, switch uh, the, the screen over to that. Um, so, we have a question from Bob Capella. First off, um, Bob asks When evaluating POD, were recorded crashes the only hit scenario? Have you considered adding closures due to wind or high wind warnings as a hit? And thanks for the great presentation. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, so yes, uh, you're right. So when we were evaluating POD, we only used recorded crashes. Uh, we did not use uh, closures mainly because um, while, while a blowover risk would still exist, even if a crash doesn't happen, in these testing phases of our algorithm, we wanted something more solid um, where we have just a blowover happened, that is our event, and whether the algorithm would have triggered for the set event um, for whatever the wind gust and other variables were. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And if I can jump in real quick, just some um, feedback we've gotten from YDOT again, um, unfortunately, after Brittany was done with her SOARS work, is that a lot of the point of this algorithm and the PIKE alert system as a whole is to try to streamline their operations. And one way of doing that is reducing the closure time. Um, so Brittany left closures out of her analysis because we're trying to reduce the amount of closures YDOT does. So we didn't want that to factor into how the algorithm was developed. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, another question from Dana Tobin. Uh, Dana asks two questions, actually. Um, first, were motorcycles included or considered as a vehicle class? And then two, does the algorithm ingest NWS high wind warnings? For example, does the algorithm automatically push out an alert if there is a high wind warning or advisory? Uh Thank you, Donna, for the question. So to answer the first question, motorcycles were actually excluded from this, um, mainly because mainly because with motorcycles and high wind, there is this risk of getting blown over more. But I I couldn't imagine you personally riding a motorcycle across the, the expanse of Wyoming. And the amount of motorcycles that were in our crash data set were very minimal um, and mainly involved uh, situations where the road was dry, the weather was good and something something just happened where it was with another vehicle and not really caused by weather. Um, to answer your second question, um, 
The algorithm does not ingest National Weather Service high wind warnings, but the thresholds and kind of ranges of our thresholds and functions do kind of tailor towards their their set threshold, the National Weather Service set threshold for high wind warnings and advisories. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think we have time for another another one or two questions. Um, next is, uh, apologize if I mispronounce the name, um, Daniel Peck or da Daniel Peck. Sorry. Um, do individual truck drivers have a good sense whether they are high light profile versus heavy loaded? Is there a specific weight definition or cutoff? And if so, are drivers aware of that weight compared to their own? Thanks uh, for the question. Uh, so as, an, as a truck driver, truck drivers are uh, very good at their job and, and mainly because they have to deal with other drivers in various scenarios. So the way that they can differentiate between whether they're a high light profile vehicle and a heavy loaded vehicle is dependent on their weight. So I don't, I don't know if you all notice when you cross state lines, you have way stations uh, at every state line. And some trucks have to go through those way stations and wait uh, as they travel throughout the country. So our definition of light, high profile vehicles and heavy, uh, pro or heavy high profile vehicles is based on how many tons that vehicle is. So as long as the truck driver knows their weight, which I have to believe that they should, um, they'll know whether they're light, high profile or heavy. Um, and in terms of the specific weight cutoff, I believe the weight cutoff between light and heavy vehicles is about 15,000 tons. Uh, I could be wrong, it's been a while. Amanda, if you, if you know the specific number, then please correct me. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think you're right. 15 or 20,000 tons, um, I, I think is what we used. And, and then the last part of your question in terms of if drivers are aware of their own weight, the traditional driver, I feel like they, they probably don't pay attention to, to such things. Um, granted the threshold between the th the difference in weight between a truck and a, a car uh, no matter how big your car is, is, is rather large. I don't think there's many cars that are over 15,000 pounds <laughs> or tons. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that answered your question. And uh, one final question um, uh, before we wrap up from Neely. I used to drive an RV through Wyoming every summer and experience those crosswinds, and I was worried about a blowover as well. Is this alert system available to non-truck drivers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the alert system, at least at the time that I was working on the project, is Uh, towards the end of their uh, program, they plan to essentially have it such that certain vehicles that were equipped with uh, information that could communicate with the transportation management center's uh, devices, such as the roadside unit, they'd be able to get information or, or the vehicle could communicate with that. And then you get some sort of alert on your phone if you have an app or something like that. Uh, I believe that was the end goal. I'm not sure if those end goals have changed since then, um, but in the future, I'm sure that uh, some vehicles that are equipped with this information to communicate with roadside units will be able to, to do that. But currently the answer is no. And just right, to well, add, um, the YDOT is planning to put this information on the dynamic message signs. So anybody who's not involved in the pilot will at least have that option for getting that information from YDOT. 
Okay, great. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap wrap things up here. So um, I want to thank everyone, uh, Ralph staff here in the Zoom room and uh, folks on the webcast for asking a lot of great questions. And of course, thank you most of all to Brittany for uh, just a, a great presentation, very informative. Um, I'd like to remind everyone our next Ralph seminar is coming up one week from today um, at uh, 1 p.m. Mountain Time on Wednesday, May 26th. Paul Markowski from Penn State University will be giving a seminar entitled, What is the Intrinsic Predictability of Tornadic Supercell Thunderstorms? And this will actually be a joint seminar shared between RAL and M-Cubed. So hope to see you all back here next week and have a great day, everyone. Thanks.